Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, on behalf of myself and uh, my uh, niece, Adi, who is very proud to work here in IDC, actually. Uh, president of IDC, actually the founder and the inspirator of IDC, Professor Reichman, uh, Dr. Ganor, the father of this beautiful singer that we just now heard, Ambassador, District Attorney, the distinguished group that we have from uh, Great Britain and from many other countries, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen. The war against terror is not one war. There is not one terror, there is not one pattern of fighting against terror. We use this term terror and I'm certain that for many, the term means many things and it may have different impacts on the lives of many people when they hear that. At the bottom line, there is one thing in common for all modes of terror, which is to try and affect the lives of innocent people, to heal innocent people, not soldiers, not fighters, in a declared, defined battlefield, but rather do it in the center of cities and towns and villages and terminals and trains and buses and coffees and private houses everywhere where people who have nothing to do with violence may be affected in such a painful manner as we have witnessed over the last years in so many different parts of the world. Today, the day of the 11th of September, is certainly a very significant and important day. It is not important only for Americans. It is important for everyone that understands that from then on, everything in the war against terror and terrorists have changed forever. The truth is that we have encountered terror many years before in a very painful way that affected the lives of the entire country for many years. But as it happened, due perhaps to some natural circumstances, it was impossible at that time to convince the entire international community that when you acquiesce with terror in one place, it may spread and become a worldwide phenomenon. For years, we were fighting against terror almost alone. Not that we were not sympathized with, not that we were not assisted by our friends, primarily by the United States of America, in many different ways, important, significant. But the truth is that, as it may happen sometimes, huge countries, big powers, when they identify a cell of terrorists in such remote place in the world, they say, well, you know, it's too small, it's tiny, it's so remote. What it can do to our way of life? Why do we have to be afraid? Why do we have to change our strategies? Why do we have to adjust ourselves together with others to declare a comprehensive combat against this? It's too small, it's too insignificant. Sometimes a small element can contain a lot of poison. And when it hits you, sometimes even when you are very big, it hurts. 
The events of September 11th have changed everything. They have changed everything because from then on, America understood that there can be no hesitation in the war against terror and that it has to be fought everywhere constantly without hesitation full force regardless of what some people in some other places which have not yet been hit by terror may think about it and I have to say that this was the policy of the United States of America since September 11th through the years at the administration of George W. Bush at the administration of Barack Obama which have changed the awareness of the international community and the determination of the international community to carry on this war and to ultimately, hopefully, to be able to contain the damage that terrorists may cause. I use this term to contain the damage because I don't want to sound too ambitious as to say that we can remove it and eliminate it entirely. Perhaps that's too much to want. But certainly we can contain it, we can reduce the impact of these terrorist activities and we can cause damage to the terrorists by declaring an offensive attitude that will never stop until we reach out for all those who are leaders of these actions of terror in various parts of the world. In this context, I think America had a dramatic achievement by reaching out for Osama bin Laden and killing him. I hope, by the way, that no American leader will get a questionnaire by any attorney from any country in the world asking him whether it was done entirely by the regulations that some think are essential when you are dealing with these killers. Osama bin Laden is dead and when Osama bin Laden is dead it's better for the world it's better for America it's better for everyone who is absolutely determined to continue the war against terror. <laughs> Talking about terror, I think it's very important that there will be an understanding that there can be no compromise as there is sometimes with bodies that pretend to be both political bodies while they are, while they are involved intensely in terrorist activities. Until 2006, Hamas was not recognized by the international community, by all the international community. It was recognized by America. It was recognized by some other countries. But most of the international community did not recognize Hamas as a terrorist organization. And I feel that I have to give credit to someone who certainly is not playing any major role in world politics today. And surprisingly, this was President Chirac of France who, in a telephone call with me, suggested the definition of the three principles that were accepted by the international community and subsequently helped declare the, uh, uh, recognize uh, the uh, Hamas as a terrorist organization. The first principle was that 
the organization must recognize the state of Israel. The second was that it has to respect all the agreements that were signed between Israel and the Palestinians. And the third principle was that they have to stop terror. And we said that if these three principles will be adopted formally and openly by Hamas, then Israel will maintain talks with Hamas because then it will not be the Hamas that we were not prepared to deal with. <coughs> but if Hamas will not recognize these three principles, then of course we will continue to fight against Hamas in every possible way, in every part of territories which were under Israeli control and which were outside of the control of the state of Israel, but where we could reach out for those who were planning and executing terrorist actions. The one who proposed the three principles was the President of France, Jacques Chirac, at that time. The president that followed him, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, was absolutely committed to carry on uh, these uh, principles uh, and uh, to uh, uh, make sure that the policy of France will be in line with these three principles, as of course was the policy of so many other countries who until then were not prepared to formally declare Hamas as a terrorist organization. But my dear friends, let's face it, while we talk about this, Hezbollah is still not recognized by all of the international community, the democratic international community at least, as a terrorist organization. It is now obvious that they were responsible for the killing of the Prime Minister of Lebanon, Saad al-Khariri, it was found by a special uh, commission of inquiry that was established by the United Nations. We all know that Hezbollah is involved constantly in terrorist activities. It is true that Hezbollah is also involved in the politics of Lebanon. But this is a terrorist organization and if we want to have credibility in our campaign against terror, we, I mean all of the Western countries, all of the democratic countries which are committed to fight terror, then we have to add the Hezbollah into the list of the terrorist organizations which are not recognized and not acceptable and are not partners to any other process but to a comprehensive battle against them in order to stop their terrorist involvement. And there is a lot that has to be done about it. How do you fight terror? You know, when we go beyond the general terminology, as I said before, there are many types of terror, there are many ways to fight terror. I have witnessed terror in my different capacities over the years, mostly as mayor of the city of Jerusalem. This was the new type of terror which started in Israel and spread across the world. Now it has become a common phenomenon in, in the Far East as well as in Europe as well as in Bulgaria, as well as in our midst here, the suicidal attacks. I saw it at the beginning in the state of Israel and particularly in Jerusalem. It's a very brutal, cruel, bloody way of terror where you kill yourself and by killing yourself you also kill so many innocent people. I've seen pictures that will never be removed from my memory in the streets of Jerusalem. I still remember the bodies that were lying on the Jaffa Street, the corner of 
King George and Strauss outside Sbarro in Jerusalem with five members of one family lying torn to pieces next to each other in Jerusalem and in so many other occasions. It requires a very sophisticated intelligence operation to identify the leaders of these terrorist cells, their locations, the potential volunteers to commit suicidal attacks, the partners that assist them in order to cross the lines and to reach out for the places where from they can go into the civilian centers and commit these suicidal attacks with the largest possible impact on the civilian population. It's one of the most difficult, most complex ways of fighting terror. And sometimes it requires manners and modes of operation which are not always popular and acceptable and appeared to be legitimate by those who live far away from where terror is taking place and, are, and feel, at least, completely immune to the possible ramifications and consequences of suicidal attacks on themselves on their families, on their friends, and on their neighbors. I remember talking to world leaders when they tried to explain to me sometimes that when Israel attacked with our military aircrafts, certain targets in Lebanon, then there is a possibility that innocent civilians will be killed. And I must admit that this is something which no one ever wanted from our side. The fear that there will be innocent victims on the other side has never been the policy of this government, of this country, of all the governments of this country ever. But what do you do when you identify with complete accuracy a launcher of a missile in a particular place with a missile on the launcher about to be shot to your side with the potential of killing children in a kindergarten or in school or in the streets or in the houses? Innocent civilians, what do you do? You refrain from attacking because of the potential danger that there will be innocent victims on the other side which is planning to attack you, or you use the natural the right of self-defense and you shoot first with the risk, which is not your policy, which is not your target, which is not your desire that innocent civilians may be hit. I know that this is a dilemma which has preoccupied the hearts and the minds of policymakers across the world. There is not a clear cut and simple answer for it. And I don't think that I can suggest. Uh, one pattern that will cover all the possible ramifications and consequences of the war against terror that will prevent either innocent victims or that will fit in with all the definitions of the criminal laws and the international treaties of all the international community under all circumstances? The answer is not simple. The one thing which I'm familiar with 
is what happens when a terrorist action succeeds. I saw it in the streets of Jerusalem, I saw it in the streets of Tel Aviv, and I also saw it in Ground Zero. I just mentioned to Ambassador Shapira that maybe I was one of the first outside uh, visitors in Ground Zero. There is a special bond between the state, the city of New York, the state of New York, and the city of Jerusalem. And I called my friend Rudy Giuliani, then mayor of, of the city of New York, and I told him, Rudy, I'm coming. And I took part early morning in a very, in the emergency council which he has created in the Chelsea Piers to uh, two or three days after the destruction of all these compounds which included the uh, World Trade Center and few more buildings where the emergency uh, headquarters of the city of New York were located originally. And he asked that I will explain some of his people how do we deal with the civilian aspects of this and of course of the how, how can we change the mood and the attitudes and the emotions of the people that were under this threat to be able to carry on towards the future without these terrible emotional uh, uh, consequences that uh, we all were afraid of. There is not one formula that can cover the old things. But there is one thing which must be remembered. If we will not carry on this dedication and determination, if we will not ignore any single cell in any single place, remote as it may be, then there is a chance that we will be able to defend our countries in most cases, which is our obligation when we deal with terror. Now, I want to define what I think are the two different levels of war against terror. One is the military operative mode that you must use. You want to fight terror, you have to have good intelligence, which is not easy, particularly because you are not talking about big, large, huge organizations. You are talking about small groups sometimes that are working in different ways than organized, big organized communities. But you have to find ways to have and implant sources and use technologies that will allow you to reach out for these terrorist groups. And you have to reach out for the leaders. You have to know in advance what you plan or what they plan. And you have a moral right to eliminate them before they eliminate your own people. Now, this is not a war which can be carried out by one country only. And thank God, unfortunately, as a result of a terrible event which has shattered the hearts of almost everyone in the world in September 11, now there is a much greater cooperation between the different services of the different countries in sharing information about the potential danger of different terrorist groups in different parts of the world and coordinating these activities in order to try and stop them. There should be clandestine operations. There should be covert operations. Sometimes there also should be noisy operations that will have the imprint of a specific country because not under every circumstance it is possible to act in a covert manner or in a clandestine manner. 
and it has to be coordinated, and there should be cooperation amongst the different services. I think that there is today a much greater cooperation. Ambassador Shapiro mentioned the uh, dramatic change in the pattern of cooperation between the intelligence services of America and Israel. It's been now a few years. I remember talking about it with President Bush. I know that President Obama, who is a friend of Israel, has adopted all these patterns of cooperation between our military and the American military, between our intelligence and the American intelligence, and carried on and continued, and in spite, as I heard, I'm not certain because I'm not in government, but I heard that sometimes in spite of difference of opinion that we may have with the American government, never did the Americans stop the intense military and intelligence cooperation with the State of Israel on a wide variety of different areas, including, of course, the war against terror, and we thank America for doing it. But it is true only, not only on the relations between us and the United States. Israel has, as other services have, uh, good relations with many other countries. I don't want to name the others. They may not be willing to uh, be recognized. But I can tell you that there is a much greater cooperation which has been inspired by the dedication and determination which the big powers, particularly the United States of America, have manifested after September 11th and has inspired many different countries to cross the limits that were defined in the past and to broaden the basis of cooperation and sharing of information and sometimes also joining in operations which have made the war against terror a lot more promising and a lot more successful than it was. There is another level which I think is not less important, perhaps more important than the operational military cooperation between countries among the different nations. And this is the diplomatic cooperation, the political cooperation. The international community will not be effective if every country will do what it thinks is right to do at a particular time, regardless of what may be the ramifications on a much larger and broader basis. There must be cooperation, there must be trust. Leaders must be able to, be, to speak to each other in the most intimate manner, knowing that they are changing their views and their evaluations and their assessments and their analysis without fearing that it will be abused by the other side. I don't want to refer to any particular event. I'm talking in general. I'm talking in principle. I'm talking about the understanding that no country, not even the biggest countries of the world, can do alone what can be done successfully by the cooperation of so many different countries which are spread in different parts of the world and which have the information and which have the abilities, which have the forces, which have the access to, together with others, to carry out the necessary operations that will ultimately determine the outcome of the war against terror. As I said, our country perhaps is more experienced than most in fighting against terror. Not because we chose it. It was forced on us. It was forced on us almost from day one of the inauguration of the State of Israel. It never stopped. It allowed us, with a very painful price over the years, to develop the patterns of operation and also the weapons and the technologies 
and the sophistication which other lacked. I think that most democratic countries in the world know that we are prepared to share the experience, the knowledge, the weapons, the technologies that we possess to strengthen the ability of the international democratic community to fight against terror. At the same time, I think that we must force ourselves, together, all of us, not to compromise for a provisional political convenience with those forces which are known to be dedicated to change the rules of the game, to support terrorist groups, to cooperate with them, and to expose the lives of innocent people in different countries to the danger of the possible outcomes of terrorist actions. I think that if there is one lesson which September 11th, among so many, has taught the State of Israel and the international community is that what seems to be remote and small and far away at one time can become very dangerous and very painful in another time if you hesitate to deal with it when it is small. We are, all of us, in an entirely different place now. We are much less naive and innocent. We are fully aware of the potential danger. We are fully dedicated to fight against it. I think that the example that the American administration of the past and of the present has manifested is something that gives hope that together we will be able to block the spread of terror, to reduce it, its danger, and to be able to reach out for those that inspire it and lead it. Thank you very much.